All right. I was waiting there. still blinking. Good evening. This is our midweek Bible study. I'm Steve Plague. I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church in St. Paul's. And we're going to continue our Bible study in Ezra. We're going to be in chapter 8 this evening. So we're going to pick up where we left off last time. So if you want to be turning there. Um, before we get started, just go through a few announcements. Um, like I say, this past Sunday, we went back inside for our worship service only. Um, we're starting at 9 o'clock. So if you want to come and join us inside, um, you can do that. We're inside um, starting at 9 o'clock. Um, if you want to still come and sit in a parking lot, we have the parking lot um, ministry still going on. We're still broadcasting on 87.9. So if you'd like to stay in your car, um, you can also do that. And of course, obviously, we still broadcast the messages on Facebook. So we'll hope so. Like I say, Sunday morning, the internet was kind of sketchy. We don't know what was going on. Um, the shows have good signal, but I think we made it through. Um, if you come inside, per regulations, you have to wear a mask if you have not been fully vaccinated, meaning you've had your shots and it's two weeks past the second shot. Um, so like I say, if you're fully vaccinated and you're two weeks past the, the second shot, you do not have to wear a mask. Um, but if you have it, then you need to wear a mask while you're indoors. Um, we do have some of the pews blocked off. We are practicing some distancing. So do not remove any tape that's on any of the pews. Sit only in those pews that are open. So. We're doing that just to add um, some safety. And we also, um, as precaution, um, are you know refraining from the handshaking and the hugging. We're gonna get there eventually. We're just gonna take this in steps, um, keeping everybody safe. Um, like I say, if you have not been paying attention to the news, Robinson County is in the lower tier of people getting vaccinated. So there's a lot of people that aren't getting vaccinated, which means that even if you are vaccinated, you still could catch the virus from somebody it wouldn't be as dangerous to you but you could be a carrier it's very unlikely but it can happen and so that's one of the reasons why we need to encourage everybody to get vaccinated um so that's you know just how we're handling it so like I say 87.9 if you're going to park in a parking lot nine o'clock so we're getting started um month of june it's hard to believe we're already in june hygiene items um soap wash rags um different things, um, combs, brushes, um, deodorants, um, even toothbrushes. But just remember, you can't send toothpaste because toothpaste is a liquid. These are all for the Christmas shoe boxes for the Samaritan's Purse. Um, so we're collecting those items in the month of June. Um, so like I say, remember, um, no liquids of any type or paste um, of any type if you bring things for those um, because like I say, they're just gonna pull them out. Um, so hygiene items for the shoe boxes for the month of June. Also, just the way that everybody knows, the Mother Day offering that um, we collected during the month of May um, totaled up to $1,520. So we passed our goal, which was wonderful. Um, the goal was $1,500. So we thank everybody for the donations. And then also remember the food pantry sponsored by the Methodist Church. We're continuing to support that. So if you have the items, bring them with you. We'll collect them and we'll get them to them. Um, this week, um, birthdays and anniversaries, June 9th, Flora Fisher. Um, also June 9th, Doris McLean. Then June 11th, Amanda Kane. So we wish all of them a happy birthday. Um, get a chance, send them a note, you know, shout out to them, however you want to communicate to them, but we wish them all a happy birthday. Then also on June 9th, this is a wonderful one. Happy 70th anniversary, Dan and Mary Beard. 70 years. What a wonderful blessing for that marriage. And all it just shows <laughs> you can stay married a long time, and it's wonderful. And I'm I'm glad. So like I say, we we'll congratulate them as well. So that's our announcements. Um, getting into our prayer list. Um, Joe and Marion Edwards, um, Ronnie Locklear, Donna and Jordan Floyd, Louise McLean, Mike and Teresa Ivy, Shirley Hammonds, Danielle Smith, Elizabeth Norton, Peggy DeLuca. Um, Kenny Jackson, Pearl Jackson, Angie Baxley, Gina White, Carol Powers, Tom Marie Taylor, Jada Clayton, Ashley Baxley, Kim Ewart, Richard Holbrook, JJ Johnson, Karen Clegg, David Warren, Matthew Ward, Kathy Beanie, Michael Davis, Beth Ward, Mac McMorrow, Peggy Kane, Joe Pate, Van Gorganis, um, Bobby Pate, Diane Townsend, Eugene and Florian Eford, Shannon Britt, 
Chloe Akers, um, Chloe surgery. His member is coming up at the end of the month. Um, so uh, that's 29th is when her surgery is scheduled. So continue to pray for her. Um, Junior House, Tamara Overby, Billy McKenzie, um, Dan Beard. Um, Dan Hat did have a fall. He was at, in, he was in the hospital. I believe he's still there. Um, have not heard an update today, but just continue to remember Dan as he's recovering. Um, Amanda Kane, Linda and Cornelius Hunt, the Frisch family, um, Daryl Britt, Tommy Edwards. I remember Tommy's surgery will be coming up in July. So continue to remember Tommy and as he prepares for that surgery. Um, the pulpit committee, our church, the lost, our nation, its leaders, our troops and their families, police officers, and then the pastors and their families. I'm um, just also a way of updates. Um, we mentioned the Frisch family, but Cooper Frisch um, had his surgery. The young boy had that. Um, he is recovering. Um, have a good day today. Um, so like I say, he will have to go through some rehab. Um, how extensive, they're not sure. Um, they're saying it's probably a little longer what they initially thought, but all that will come out when they get there. I mean, you're talking about a young child, and sometimes they bounce back pretty quick. So we'll just continue to pray for Cooper. Um, remember Melvin and Juanita Dove. Um, then um, Edward Ivey, um, a friend of Bobby, um, had three stints put in. So I remember him. Um Freddie Eshwell um, also will have neck surgery this week, so remember her. So a lot going on there. Um, David Garrett, um, I mentioned he had the heart attack, doing well, spoke to him today. Um, still on restrictions, still working through some things, but he is doing well, um, so progress there. Also, um, I forgot to mention Sunday, I had three different people uh, mention to me stomach issues um, going around Sunday morning. Uh, hopefully, they're all feeling much better. Um, but it makes me think that there is a stomach bug going around, evidently, that um, we, it was odd that we had three people um, mention to me issues with stomachs. So um, keep all of those in your prayers as well. Um, if you haven't seen the news, um, um, like I say, I'm always adamant about this because, like I say, I think we got to be careful. Um, scripture tells us, you know, to watch out for each other and protect each other. Um, in the news today, like I say, New variant um, coming out of India. I was not surprised with this. What is it? India is a billion people. Um, flu, not the flu, but COVID is just running rampant through there. And obviously, when you have so much going through and just such high deaths and the number of infections, it's very easy for the for the virus to mutate. And we do have a variant um, that's there, and it has entered the United States. So we are seeing it in the United States as well. And it has its own risk because it's a different variant, but vaccine protects. Um, they're still showing that the vaccine should protect it. So, like I said, another reason for the protection of that. Remember, our nation is leaders. Um, obviously, there's just things going on with this nation, and we need to be praying for it, um, praying for the people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, like I say, we need the people to get, be moved, um, to come back to God. And if they've never been to God, to find God. Um, we need to be praying for the spiritual health of this nation. Um, like I say, if not, we're we're just you know going down a path that we just don't want to go down. And um, like I say, we just need to be praying for the people and praying for the nation. And if God is, lays upon you, we are to be part of the work. Um, we're not just supposed to sit on the sidelines and pray. We're supposed to be part of the solution. God put the church here for a reason. Um, so if you're sitting there thinking, well, all I need to do is pray, no, <laughs> God has a reason and a purpose for you. So you know, be willing to respond to what God leads you to. Um, so, like I say, multiple um, things going on, um, more gun violence, even more so we're hearing some, even in St. Paul's. Um, we did have a couple shootings within the last week, last few days. Um, like I say, you need to be in prayer for that because too many people are thinking guns are the answer. And like I say, I'm not against guns. I'm against people using guns against people. <laughs> if, you know, if you want to talk about it, I mean, when we start thinking that shooting somebody is the solution, that's not right. Um, another case of road rage, I think it was up near, um, Durham today, or Durham, somebody shot into another car with a high fired rifle. Um, we just need to get away from this, thinking that violence is the answer. We need, the church needs to set examples of peacemakers, and we need to help people. And, um, we're not going to get there unless the church gets busy, so. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. And Father, we just praise you and give you the glory. And Father, we do thank you for the recent rains. Um, we were getting extremely dry. And Father, you know best. And we just pray that you'll continue to balance the rain with the sunshine and all. Father, to bless the farmers and the efforts they put forth in their fields and the things that need to be grow. And Father, we just beautify your creation. And Father, we just give you the glory and thank you for it. And Father, this evening, we just come to you and give you the glory. And Father, the praise reports and things that we know there are people that are just have a wonderful re response to you, Father. You know, the, the healing Cooper is getting stronger. You know, Dan was showing um, strength in his um, array and, you know, getting back on his feet. And Father, the others that are recovering and getting stronger. And Father, we just thank you for those healings. We just praise you and give you the glory. And Father, we just ask you to continue to guide us and direct us. And Father, we pray for those on our prayer list. There's many that are afflicted, many that are shut-ins. And Father, it's hard to be a shut-in, even more so during the viruses. People restricted, not able to come and see you. Father, let them know they're not alone. Bless them and keep them, Lord. Let them know that there's those that love them. Most of all, let them feel your love, Lord. They'll keep them happy and joyous and secure. And Father, we also pray for those who have um, recently had surgeries and procedures. And Father, we just are thankful that you've been there and guided through those. And Father, just continue to pray for good outcomes that come for those. Father, we have others who have upcoming tests. Um, also, upcoming surgeries come up, some quite major. Father, we just lift them up to you. And we know that you're already there for your outside of time. You're already in the present, the past, and the future. And Father, we just know that you're there and you're going to guide through those things. And Father, we lift all those names up to you. And Father, those people, they need to feel your, feel your strength, Lord. And Father, that they'll have the assurance knowing that you're with them as they go through all these different things. And Father, we also lift up those private and personal concerns. I know there's many people who have private and personal requests. And Father, the dealing with families, jobs, finances, education, the range is endless. And Father, they're just seeking your will and seeking your guidance. And Father, we just pray that you'll just bless them with your wisdom and understanding that they'll make the right decision, that they'll do the right things. Not to bring glory to ourselves, but to bring glory to you, Lord. Father, we just need to make sure that we're doing all things for you and not for ourselves. Father, if we're truly serving you, we are serving ourselves for your will would guide us to do the things that you would have us to do, to fulfill your purpose for our lives. And Father, we just pray this evening for our nation. Father, heal our nation. Obviously, it's the spirit of the people that is the sickest. And Father, we talked about the sixth Sunday. And Father, there's so many people that need the great physician. And Father, obviously, there's physical healing that needs to take place. But Father, the spiritual. Father, we just pray that the spiritual healing will take place. That people will reach out to you. That they'll call out on the name of Jesus and be saved. Father, that they'll understand that we're not divided, but we need to be together. Strengthen us as a nation, Lord. Bless us with good leadership from the top to the bottom. Let us not fall into the wayside and knowing that you'll remove the good leadership from us when we stray from you. Father, I pray that we come back to you and that we seek you out so that you'll bless us with good leadership and that your will be done in all things. And Father, we pray for the churches and we pray that you'll just continue to work in them and use them, Lord. And may we do your will. So often we get caught up in the ways of the world and we think, oh, this is what the world needs or this is what the world wants. And we miss the point. Father, use us to carry out your will and your plan for each and every church. And Father, we just ask that you'll bless our military, Lord, and keep them safe. For many are in very dangerous situations. We pray that you'll just bring them home safely to their families. And Father, we pray for our first responders, the firefighters, the ambulance drivers, the police officers, all those that go in where others run away. And Father, we just pray for their protection. And Father, we pray for peace in our nation. To me, people are turning to violence for solution. Lord, it just don't work. Innocent people are being hurt. Innocent people are being killed. And an example is being set that just is not right. And Father, we need peace in our nation. We need peace on our roads and 
in our homes. And Father, that's only going to come from you. Father, bless the church and all that it does. Bless us to do the things that you've called us to do. Let us not shy away from them, but let us embrace them and do them heartily and fully to your glory. Father, bless this Bible study and teach us and show us all that you'd have us to do. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. We're in Ezra 8. Um, remember last time we were with Ezra? Um, we, he just finished calling together um, those to go back to Jerusalem with him. Remember, he's got permission to go back and to take those who are willing to go back with him. Um, he also has been appointed by the king to do different things. And so in pulling this group together, he's basically focused on 18 family leaders. Um, and why would you focus on the family leaders? Well, you know, if the, mat the patriarch of the family would go back, then most likely the rest of the family will go back and follow. So you'll be able to bring in a greater number. These were very influential people, you know, among their families and extended families and their peers and Ezra focused on them to get them to go back to Jerusalem. And with that, they were able to bring others. And so all total with those that they were able to influence to come back and the others that wanted to go back, there was 1,515 men. Now, in addition to that, you also have the women and the children who are also going with, with them. So some group, the number estimates anywhere from four or 5,000 all the way up to nine you know, up to possibly seven or 8,000, maybe nine of us. You know, when you start putting men, women and children there, you don't know how many there is. So anyways, 1,515 men plus the families. And like I say, this one is bigger group that was going up as last time. Um, you know, there was a much larger group that went up with Zerubbabel and Joshua. And that was, think about now, think about, we're now 80 years past that time. Yeah, you know, we'll read through the Bible and you don't realize, it, but really, by the time you get to Ezra, you're 80 years past the time that Zerubbabel went back to Jerusalem. So we're a far cry from that. And um, even though this group was smaller, mm. excuse me, it didn't discourage them. Um, give me a good drink. Um, with this, if you look through the names and compare them, you'll see that there's a lot of the, the companions that are with Ezra. Also, were names that are similar to those of four. So, you know, it looks like some of the families that went back before, now others, extended family further back, are also coming up and going back. So, you know, maybe um, it kind of runs in the families. Okay, if they went back, we're going to come back too, given the opportunity, even though it's 80 years later. Um, so, like I say, the group that left Babylon in kind of some days here, um, the first day of the month, um, of the fifth month, um, was, you know, about a week of travel. And then they stopped at the river Ahava, which is probably more of a canal than a river. And they stayed there for three days um, before moving forward. Um, during that time, Ezra took inventory of the people and discovered that there were no Levites with them. 15 or 15 people were going back, or men, and in this group, there's no Levites. So then he sent out a special committee to the of the 11 leading men to go recruit some Levites for the journey. And they returned with 38 Levites, not very many, but 220 temple servants came along with them. So there's you know, still not the numbers they need because people in Jerusalem need more people, but it's still a number that was there. And so, like I say, you take with what God's given you and you use it to the best of your ability. And um, so, like I say, they're getting ready to move on. So verses 21 and 23 to 23 is where we're going to pick up. Remember, they're at the, the river Havava. And then it says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Havava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him the right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For, while I, was for I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all that would forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Now, Ezra's whole approach 
or attitude or however you want to say it of approaching this journey is spiritual. Ezra, remember, he's very spiritual. And, you know, he constantly says it, and we see it several times, the hand of God was with them, the good hand of God. And so, like I say, if God wasn't with them, it was going to fail. And we've already seen the things that God has set out to do. God has already allowed Ezra to return. He's got permission to return. He's got permission to take anybody that wants to go back to go back. He's got permission to gather up all the gifts that the people want to send back to the people in Jerusalem and to the temple. And, all. and then on top of that, he's emptied you know, the temples. Um, the kings allowed him to take certain things of the treasury and all and things that belong to the temple and take them back with him. So all these things, there's all these blessings that God has just opened up door after door after door. But obviously God is with Ezra to go back. And so it wasn't going to fail. And so, you know, what they've done, they've received the blessing and they've humbled themselves to God. So God, what has Ezra done here? He's called for three days of fasting and prayer, asking God for protection for the journey. Now, Ezra could ask for an armed escort, and then we're going to see why Ezra would possibly need an armed escort, but he could have asked for it. Um, but since he's been going around saying God's going to take care of us, God's going to protect us and all this stuff, and God is you know, a provider, you know, for him to go back and say, oh, by the way, we need a guard to keep us from getting hurt, it would kind of sound like he was going backwards with what he said about God. And... Um, so, like I say, he had already told Arctasis God was a good God and his hand was upon them. So, if his hand was upon them, God was going to bring them through. Um, so, how could he ask for human help if he already said that God's hand was with them? So, Ezra, at this point, is committed and he's demonstrating that he is going to rely on God's covenant with Abraham. And that's sort of, you know, what he's doing. And when you start relying on God, you're relying on God to keep his word and keep his promises. And in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, it says this, this is the covenant with Abraham. Now the Lord said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. What says Ezra doing here? He's counting on God. If people come up against us, then God's going to be against them. He was going to let the hand of God deal with them rather than, you know, get some soldiers or whatever to march with them. So, like I say, here he's drawing that fine line of, between faith and presumption. Now, later, 14 years later, Nehemiah's going to come, but he's going to bring an armed guard with him. Different situation, different way they're being led. Remember, everything about Ezra has been very spiritual. And so he was not looking for that. Then you go back and you look at Paul also. When Paul, he was glad for the Roman soldiers who protected him during his journey from Jerusalem to Caesarea. There is a time and a place for these things. And understanding those is what's part of the wisdom and understanding your walk with God. Ezra clearly was, I can't step back from this. I started this out in faith. I'm going to walk this in faith and follow through. And that was part of what the king saw in him. The king readily recognized Ezra's faith and his reliance upon God. And that's part of why he, the king gave him permission. He believed in what Ezra was saying. It wasn't just talk. He actually saw Ezra living it. What an example for us. When we live our faith, we can influence people by the way we live. Ezra lived it, and he did. And so, like I say, we're not saying that Paul or Nehemiah or them were less um, faithful or you know, had less faith than Ezra, but their means and their issues that were going on at that time were differently. But here, Ezra had, obviously, the Lord gave him unquestionable faith for his journey. He knew that Ezra had to have this faith, and God blessed him with it. And so Ezra's desire was to glorify God. So anything he did, he made sure he didn't dishonor God or take away from God. He wanted God to be glorified. It wasn't about Ezra. It wasn't about the people with him. It was about God. And so you see Ezra's face. And then, and then you like to say, then here we have several thousand Jews who were inexperienced in travel. 
They've been they've been holding them captive. They've not been traveling all over Babylon. They've been basically in captivity wherever they were. And so, you know, you wouldn't call this, you know, a, a very good band of people who can defend themselves and know what to look out for and all that on the road. Now, this is a group of pilgrims or people that were, you know, not very strong in the sense of that. Um, and then what happens here? What are they doing? They're carrying a fortune in gold and silver. I mean, they're talking about a lot. And, you know, they're led by a scholar, not a soldier. Um, and then on top of this, they're going to make this journey. And it's not going to be through, oh, these are all happy lands and everything's good. They're going to go through some dangerous places. This journey is going to take four months. And it's 900 miles. So plenty of opportunity for raiders and such to come in and take what they had. And if you look at Ezra, he's like, well, he's a biblical scholar. He's no leader of a of a caravan. He's no leader to, you know, defend us if we come under attack. Ezra's just a, a minister, so to speak. Um, so like I say, so he had to rely on God, and the people had to believe in God and follow. There was a bit of faith on their side as well. So let's pick them one up. We're going to start reading on down through. And it says, starting in verse 24, Then I separated twelve of the chief priests, Sherebus, Hashabib, and ten of their brethren with them, and weighed unto them the silver and the gold and the vessels, even the offering of the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel, um, their present, had offered. I even weighed unto the hand 650 talents of silver and silver vessels and a hundred talents and of gold a hundred talents. And, and also 20 basins of gold of a thousand drams and two vessels of fine copper, precious as gold. And I said to them, you are holy unto the Lord. The vessels are holy also. And the silver and gold are a freewill offering unto the Lord God of your fathers. Watch ye and keep them. Until you weigh them before the chief of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers of Israel at the time at Jerusalem in the chamber of the house of the Lord. So it took the priests and the Levites the weight of silver and gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem unto the house of God. Now, once those are done, he's divided up the treasures that's got to go back. How big is the treasure? Well, the basically they're saying the treasure is about 25 tons of silver. 25 tons or 50,000 pounds of silver. Not no small little amount of silver. And then there's about another 8 tons of silver and gold vessels. And then plus other vessels and the offering that the people made. And so he picked 12 men who represented the 12 tribes of Israel and had an obligation to them. So he keeps them responsible, keeps them honest. That's what he's doing here. And so he also let them know it wasn't their treasure, it wasn't the people's treasure, it was the Lord's. It was given to the Lord. And that they would one day have to give an accounting to him. Now, if we took and said, okay, what's this total up to? What are we talking about? Well, it'd be well into the millions today. I haven't heard anybody, because they don't know what all the specifics are, give a value of this. But they're saying it is well in the millions, just 25 you know, this tons, 25 tons of silver is massive. And then eight tons of silver and gold. I mean, it's just massive amounts of precious metals. And so, like I say, they were totaled well into the millions. So, yes, this would make them a prime target to be robbed on their journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. People are going to say, wow, look what they got. We want it. And so, like I say, you can see why this is a dangerous journey. Now, also, you know, reading through this in the commentators and lesson writers, they're saying, you know, we need to look at this journey and draw a comparison from it. And with that, what are we talking about? The Christian life, the journey that we take each and every day of a Christian life. And like I say, where we like to admit or not, we're on a difficult and dangerous journey. I mean, in life heading, you know, we're heading to Jerusalem, so to speak, the spirit, heavenly Jerusalem. But we are on a dangerous journey. And so some could say, well, this sort of reminds you of Pilgrim's Progress, you know, the journey that they're making there. But the thing of it is, you know, most people say, well, my life's not that dangerous. 
Maybe it's not. Maybe you've been blessed and you have no danger physically in your life. But like it or not, you are in a dangerous situation when it comes to spiritual. Because the enemy is around us. The enemy wants to stop us. The enemy wants to halt us, paralyze us, get us anything. So so we're not about God's will. And if they can discredit us and discredit our worship, or I mean our, our witness, they're going to do it. And because of that, we're under attack. Either that which we see or that which is being laid underneath us that we'll fall and trip on. So there are spiritual dangers around us. And those are ten- eternal. And you think about people who are traveling through life, you know, who are not Christians. Those who have never accepted Christ, they are in grave danger because they are lost and they are damned to eternal hell. That's where they're going because they have no hope. They don't know Jesus. We, you know, are faced the consequences of our acts. If we portray Jesus, if we choose to go against God's will, there's consequences of it. And so we have that. But so much of people whose spiritual life fails, the consequences from God, sometimes I want to say are less because what has happened to them personally, they have been dishonored. Other people look at them and say, wow, you claim this, but you're now a liar because this is what you did. And uh, they lose their reputation. They lose their, you know, thing. So there's so much that happens. So now, like I say, now on our journey, you know, God's committed to us. When we say, what's God committed to us? We have certain treasures. You know, our task is to protect what he's given us and be ready to give account. A stewardship, you know, God's given us his word. How many Christians have abused God's word? How many Christians have used God's word to serve their own good? To serve themselves? But part of the treasure, and you say, well, everybody can get a Bible. That's no big thing. No, what I'm talking about is your understanding of what God's word means. See, anybody can go read the Bible. That don't mean they're going to understand it. They're not going to be able to read it with the Holy Spirit guiding them through it. The Christian has that. At our fingertips, the Holy Spirit is with us. And he wrote the scriptures through man. And we have that at our fingertips and our disposal to help us understand God's word. So we understand what scripture says. To the person who is outside the church, to God's word reads his foolishness. Oh, the world was never flooded. This didn't happen. That didn't happen. And they'll discredit all these things. And where we step out on faith, they throw them away. We have a treasure and God's word is a great part of it. The other treasure, think of your most valued treasure. Your salvation. What a treasure that we need to protect, but not only protect, but nurture and make it grow within us so it becomes greater within us so we can share Jesus with others. So we have this treasure and God's given it to us. And at the end of the journey, he's going to ask us for an accounting. What have you done with what I've given you? What did you do with my word that I gave you? What did you do with your salvation? What did you do with this blessing and that blessing? He's going to ask us for an accounting of it. And just like the servant in the parable, he's going to expect an increase. He does not expect us to take our blessings and take the, what he's given us that is precious and go dig a hole and bury it. And then that's it. God expects us to invest it and increase it. And bring it back to him tenfold plus. I can say that should ring a bell with you. But that's the exact meaning of that parable. So let's continue. Like I say, we look at the journey. And then, you know, we see Ezra, you know, as they're moving forward. And Ezra 831. Then we we departed from the river Hahava. And on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem, the hand of of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy, and of such as lay in wait in the by the way. They left Babylon the first day of the fifth month, first month, tarried three days at Haba, and then they left the encampment on the twelfth day of the first month, arriving at Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. And remember, earlier I mentioned they covered 900 miles in about four months, and 
it says the good hand of God was upon them. And he protected them during their journey. And, you know, as they most likely didn't walk on the Sabbath, you know, they would come to about 8.7 miles a day, every day. Get up, walk 8.7 miles. Get up the next day, walk 8 point, do that six days in a row, stop for a day, and then pick it up and do it again for four months. And a lot of you say, well, 8.7 miles ain't that far. 8.7 miles is a lot when you're not dealing with paved roads or sidewalks. And then on top of that, you're carrying everything that you've got to take to the promised land. Then on top of that, you have this treasure of over 25 tons of silver and gold and all these other things that have to be taken back. You have to take all the food that you need for the journey. Everything you're going to need for the journey, you got to take with you. So you would have probably, you know, hopefully you have some animals and maybe an, you know, a wagon or such, or maybe you're pulling a wagon. Maybe you're physically pulling this small cart and you're, you know, carrying it on and got a pack on your back and we don't know this you know so 8.7 miles with you know imagine packing up your house and manually transporting it to another country or, or another place maybe it's a country in this case 900 miles away don't don't worry about saying oh well i'll go get a moving truck no 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 i'm saying carry it on your back I guarantee a lot of people would look at their possessions and look at their households differently if they had to think about getting up and carrying everything they own on their back and what's important to them and what's not. It'll put you in perspective real quick. What will I not pack up and take on my back? So like I say, but this is what they did. And so you're talking about this. And then, but one of the things... I'm about to say weren't alone. God was with them. And they had to rely on that because this journey was not safe. There's thieves and robbers and all that laying in wait, obviously. But one of the things that they had to rely on, and it's something that we need to hold on to, is the characteristic of God. He finishes what he starts. Ezra was told to go to Jerusalem. He was to take his group with him and do all these things. And God set that in motion and allowed it to happen. And because of that, he was going to make sure they got there. The good hand of God was upon them. God finishes what he starts. And this needs to be comforting to us in our lives. Because for us, there's things going on. And we know that God will finish what he starts. And when we commit our lives and when we call on Jesus to save us, then in that, we know that he, God is going to begin a good work in us. And he's going to continue to work it out throughout our lives, and he's going to bring it to a completion. God don't just start it and stop. You know, we call God the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the start to the finish. This is God. And so at the beginning of our journey in life, when we decide to walk with Jesus till the very end, when we're called home, God is going to be with us. It is his character. It's his ways. And he will see to it that he fulfills his loving purposes in our lives. He doesn't forsake us. This should be comfort to us. That God is with us. Yet too many Christians forget it. Too many Christians don't hold on to this. They don't have this assurity in their wild in their life they don't have it because they don't hold on to it and recognize the character of god i remember once years ago doing a bible study talking about the characters of god and this is one of them that one of the characteristics is god's steadfast he starts and he finishes you know if he starts it he finishes it he's going to do it you know all right moving forward at verse 32 and we came to jerusalem and abode there three days now, some people say, well, Ezra came, probably got there, you know, and they arrived just before the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was the next day. They rested, took an extra day, and they rested. Um, so, like I say, it was interesting. One of the, the commentaries says, sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do is to do nothing. 
Jesus told his busy disciples, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. After this journey, it was very fitting that yeah, Ezra and his company need to rest. I don't care, you know, how you reason it out, be it David, they arrived before the Sabbath or whatever. They have been walking and been on the road for four months. A lot of people struggle to get on the road and go a day's journey someplace or a few hours. If you're traveling with small kids, you you know that are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know. They've been on the road for 120 days. They've had to move everything that they owned that they were bringing to Jerusalem. And what did they do? They asked. You know, they asked. They asked God's hand to be upon them, and it was. He took care of them. Remember that? They, they dedicated themselves. They're, they're fasting, you know, and God brought them all the way. And now here they are. They're resting for three days. They're going to take a break. They're tired. Verses 33 and 34. It says, Now on the fourth day was the silver and the gold and the vessels weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah the priest. And with him was Eleazar, the son of Phinehas. And with them was Josabad, Joseph, the son of Jeshua. And Noadiah, the son of Benyai, Levites, by the number and by weight of every one, and all weight was written at that time. All right. They got rested up. They're tired from the journey. What did they do? Get down to business. And the first business that they took care of was taking everything they brought with them. That was to go to the temple. That was the offerings. That was, you know, the things that were brought. And they took it to the temple. And it was weighed and inventoried. And everything was written down in an official report to be sent to the king. Now, one of the things, it's not, you know, some crazy chaotic thing. 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says this. Let all things be done decently in order. These things were done decently in order. They were recorded. Everything was written down because the king wanted to make sure nothing came up missing. Also, Ezra wanted to make sure nothing was missing because he was entrusted to bring it with him. And also, everything was done in a very orderly fashion. And, you know, this applies so much to what we're to do, but a lot of people say this applies to money. Yes, obviously. And all, but also in other areas of the business or the functions of the church. Chaos is not reflective of God's nature. Orderly fashion. We have a business meeting. We want it done in an orderly fashion. We want to be done in a respectful way, so not to demean people, but to give everybody the opportunity to speak, give everybody the equal opportunity to vote, you know, all these different things. It's to be done in the right way, and if it's done chaotically or with yelling and shouting, and you know, it does not glorify God. It only makes us look how pitiful we really are. And so, like I say, do all things in an orderly Fashion decently and orderly, as scripture says. All right. Also, what it tells us is God's people have to be faithful in everything. These people that carried this treasure had to be faithful to God to take care of it, to make sure it got there and everything was right. And so, like I say, when we're given this responsibility by God to carry treasures, and we have treasures that we talked about earlier. Here they had monetary things that God had blessed them with to carry, to take to them. They had to be very careful about it. Because if it came up missing in any way or sort, what happened to them? Well, they could be held accountable by the king. All kinds of things could have happened to them. But most of all, they would have been named a thief. They would have been named a thief. And if they tried to you know, say, well, I didn't do it and all, then they would have called them a liar. So they'd be called a thief and a liar. No, they were very careful to make sure everything got there and that it was accounted for. Paul and his associates did the same type of thing when they were taking the relief offering that the Gentile churches got back to Jerusalem. They were very diligent about making sure they took everything and did it properly. And also they would not bring any discredit. You know. 2 Corinthians 8.21 says, For we are taking pains to do what is right. Not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. The eyes of men will see us here on earth. The eyes of the Lord see us from heaven. We will not escape, no matter where we are, from the eyes of someone looking at what we've done. 
So we have to be careful and we must be responsible in handling these things. And so, like I say, you're talking about this and that was from 2 Corinthians 8, 21. When we talk about being responsible and bringing these things and all, we're talking about stewardship. You were all, you know, when we bring things and have responsibilities, be it financial or objects of some type, we're talking about stewardship. And we need to make sure that we're handling everything right when it comes to the Lord. Okay, verse 35. And also the children of those that have been carried away, which were come out of the captivity, offered burnt offerings unto the God of Israel. Twelve bullocks for all of Israel, ninety and six rams, seventy and seven lambs, twelve he goats for a sin offering, and all was a burnt offering unto the Lord. So here we go. All the Jewish residents with the new arrivals gather at the altar of God. Okay, they've taken care of the things they need to take care of. They're rested and acknowledged when they come, and they gather at the altar. And this is a declaration of unity. And the 12 burnt offerings and the 12 sin offerings were for the 12 tribes of Israel, represented by the Jewish remnant. If you go back to the first time that this happened, 75 years earlier, Remember when it came to offer and offered it, there was people that were lamenting, lamenting about the old days. You don't see that here. That is past. That's not what's going on. And for the new arrivals, what's going on here? Think about it. They've arrived at the temple. The first time in their life they've been able to worship in the temple. You have to imagine what's that mean to Ezra. Here he is, a, a religious leader, a scribe, you know, a student of the law, a student of God's word. And he finally gets to set foot in God's temple. Something he's only heard about his whole life. And he gets to step foot in it. Then he hears, you know, a sacrifice, the things that are being made, and they sacrifice. And he's part of the worship. It had to be moving for him. I know Sunday when we went back inside, it was very moving for some people. Finally get to go back into our place of worship. It was sort of like returning back to an old friend. Yeah, something that we're comfortable with. But let us not be comfortable to the point that we become complacent. Let us, on the reverse of that, let us be so rejoiceful about being able to come back inside that we're not going to take it for granted, but we're going to use the house of God for exactly what it's intended. And that is to be a method and a means of ministry to reach the lost. Verse 36 in Ezra, and they delivered the king's commissions unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors on this side of the river, and they furthered the people in the house of God. So now they took care of the spiritual matters, and now they're saying, okay, now we've got to take care of the national matters. And so Ezra then presented himself and his credentials to the local, per local Persian officials. And, you know, remember the scripture says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. What Ezra is doing here is, okay, I took care of the things that were God's. Took care of, now I have the king's paper. These things have to be done. These are going to be his orders. And now he presented them to the Persian leadership that was in that side of the river. And so once upon seeing the letter and all, they are all quick to obey the king's orders and assist the Jews in the things they were doing. So we step back. Ezra left Babylon with God's law in his heart and a king's letter in his hand and the good hand of God upon him. And because of that, the mission was a success. Was it a success because the king had given him papers? No. Was it a success because Ezra felt in his heart, this is what I need to do? No. It was a success because it's what God wanted him to do. And God's hand was upon him. And he was not going to fail. If God is with you, who can be against you? Ezra's journey was a fine example of this, and we should always strive to be in God's will and be about our Heavenly Father's business. Why did Ezra succeed? One, he wasn't serving himself. Oh, he wanted to go back to Jerusalem. Don't get me wrong. 
But the thing it was, the purpose of going back, God had given him a purpose to go back. Not only a purpose, but to lead a group back. So Ezra's return to Jerusalem fulfilled, yes, it was something he wanted to do. But it was what God wanted him to do. And God wanted him to take other people back with him. So he was in God's will, not Ezra's will. And so if we're in God's will and we're about God's heavenly business, then we will succeed because God is not going to fail and God is not going to be shamed or embarrassed. The only time that, that, that we see when things fail of God is when man steps away from God's will and his plan and we bring the shame upon ourselves. We like to cast it off and blame God for it because saying, well, God didn't do this. But the truth of it is we brought it on ourselves because we didn't do something according to God's will. But again, this is a good lesson that, that we understand. If we're in the Father's will, if we're doing what God wants us to do, then we can do the things that we need to do. And that will be an amazing thing for all of us. So with that, let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, let us learn from Ezra. Let us learn from your scriptures. May the Holy Spirit open them up and interpret them for us, Lord, that we'll have a full and complete understanding of your will. Guide us and direct us, Father. Show us all that you have us to do. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless each of us until we're able to come out again and be together. Father, we just praise you and thank you for your blessings. And Father, guide us in all things and bring us back together again as we'll have our Sunday morning service and all in Walsh I have the Bible studies. And Father, just bring glory to yourself and may your will be done in all things. Protect us and keep us. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you and you have a good night. Amen.